Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Catechism. At BRCC, we believe that our catechism is a useful tool to help us understand and grow in our faith. But why? Find out in our series Catechism. Uh, today's text is going to come out of Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. We're really just uh, spending some time this fall going through a number of the early questions in our catechism. This was actually uh, a couple of my study weeks away. I worked on our uh, catechism years ago, and we're uh, working through it. We're going to be working it in with our children's ministry more. And today we're going to be looking at what is the fifth question, which is who is God? So we're going to be looking at Revelation 4, 6 to 11. It's there in your booklets. I'll be using the NIV. It'll also be up here uh, on the screen, and you can follow along or follow along in your Bible. Hear now the word of the infinite, eternal, sovereign God. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whatever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Uh, when I was a, a young plebe, uh, back in 1979, we were nearing the end of plebe summer, and my squad leader said, I want to ask you guys a question. So all you guys come from high school, and you think you're something, what kind of grades do you think you're going to make while you're here? And he randomly pointed to me and said, Midshipman Hicks, what do you think you're going to get? And I kind of snickered and said, uh, a 4.0. And he said, what? I said, a 4.0. And he said, why would you think that? And I said, because I always get a 4.0. And he laughed and said, you won't while you're here. I just kind of said, okay. Fast forward a few weeks, I got my first test back from my calculus class. And at the top, the professor wrote 60. And I gave you most of those points. And I said, okay, we've gone through a critical misjudgment <laughs> of of capabilities and requirements here. And I thankfully was able to recover from that and do okay, and that's not one that will end your life. But I learned real quickly that sometimes we misapprehend the way things actually are. And again, you can recover from that one, but the reason I bring that story up is because many people today misjudge who God is and who they are. And you can recover from misjudging your own abilities relative to the academic requirements that are facing you. But if you misjudge who God is, there is no recovery. A.W. Tozer many years ago said, the most important thing about a person is what they think about God. So our question is, who is God? And our catechism defines the answer to who is God is that God is the infinite eternal, sovereign creator of everything. So what I want to do today is go through this text in Revelation and unpack why we say this is who God is. Is that true? Because we can't afford to be off on this. And that is not the answer that most of us are born working off of. In fact, that's the answer we fear, the one that's up there. We would rather God be someone else. So is this who God is? Now, when we dive into the text, and you notice here in Revelation 4, the picture that is given of God is that he is absolutely awesome. This is a picture 
of the awesomeness of God. Now, awesome is a word we throw around today. Oh, this thing is awesome. That was incredible. But I mean it truly as it is. It's God is a being who leaves people awestruck. Notice the picture here in Revelation chapter 4. We see in the center around the throne, there's these four living creatures. And we've spoken of these in a couple of different series. They came in the church to represent the four gospels and four aspects of who Jesus is. And these creatures are like lion and an ox and a man and an eagle. And they've got all these wings and they're covered with eyes. But notice what they're doing. Day and night, it says they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. These creatures who are in the presence of God nonstop never grow uh, to a place where they say, eh, he's not really that great. Always, always they are struck by the awesomeness of God. There is nonstop worship. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy. And a, and a few, later on in the fall, we're going to cover the character of God, and, and holiness is one that is often forgotten. And the base idea of holiness is that something is separate. It is distinct. It is other. And when they see God, they cry out not once, not twice, three times. He is the perfection of holiness. God is distinct and other and completely awesome and set apart even from these powerful angelic beings who surround his throne. So when they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, what they are saying is you are distinct and you are vastly superior to anything else in the universe. That's the first fundamental fact we have to reckon with in dealing with God. Now, when we consider that and we look at the Scripture, I'm going to give four reasons that we list in our catechism to try and describe this awesomeness, four attributes of who God is. The first one is God is infinite. He alone has no bounds. There's multiple ways we can look at this. I'll just point out a few, and I'm going to actually go to that Scripture that Greg prayed there out of Psalms. Uh, Psalm 139. First, God is infinite in knowledge. The old word for this coming from the Latin is omniscient. He is all-knowing. In Psalm 139, the psalmist prays, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. And in verse 6, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Notice what the psalmist is saying. I'm not even aware of the word I'm about to speak, but you already know it. God knows everything about everything. God knows everything that has ever been, everything that is, everything that ever will be, and everything that ever could be. Now that's knowledge. That's not the way you and I are. And Note, when the, the psalmist says such knowledge is too wonderful for me, what he's getting at here is not only does God know all these things, and he knows what the psalmist is going to say before the psalmist has even thought it, God's knowledge is not like yours and mine. Remember, God is holy. He is distinct. You and I learn by studying. I arrogantly thought I was going to get a 4.0 and it wasn't going to be that hard, and I discovered getting significantly less than a 4.0 was going to take a lot of work. God doesn't have to work to know anything. He inherently and immediately knows everything. He does not study. He does not grow in his knowledge. He does not go through a process of learning. He knows all that is, was, ever will be, ever could be, and he knows it immediately and inherently. If you get that, the only thing you can do is with the psalmist say, whoa, that is beyond me. That, that, is, that is completely other than what I am. But God is not only infinite in his knowledge, he is infinite in his presence. The old word for this is omnipresent. The psalmist goes on in Psalm 139 in the very next verses and says this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, the Hebrew word is actually Sheol. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. The psalmist is saying, not only do you know all things, You are everywhere. You fill all things. There is nowhere I can go where you are not. And the phrase, if I go to heaven, you're there, and if I go to Sheol, you're there, it's what's known uh, in literary terms as a merism. It's A to Z, top to bottom. He's saying, if I go to the highest place I can think of, which is the highest heavens, there you are. And if I descend to the lowest place I can think of, which is Sheol, the realm of the dead, you're there too. And that means you are everywhere in between. And once again, God's presence is different than yours and mine. We can only be present in one place at one time. God can be everywhere at once. And if I'm going to move, today I'm going to go from Annapolis down to Woodbury, Georgia. And when I get down there, I'm going to have to take a plane and go there. God is all places all the time. His presence is inherent and his presence is immediate. He does not move to be somewhere. It's not possible for there to be somewhere where he is not. It's not even possible. Once again, the psalmist would invite us to say, if you understand this, you start getting a little woozy in the head. Because you and I are not like this. We, we try to get places fast. God already is there there is nowhere away from him not only that see and each of these gets increasingly scary god knows everything about me you don't my wife comes very close you don't thanks be to god he does and there's no hiding wherever i go he is and thirdly wherever he is He's there, infinite in power. He is omnipotent. Now I'm going to go back to our text in Revelation 4, 8, and we'll spend most of the rest of the time there. Notice that when they cry out, they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, what? Almighty. Not kind of mighty. Not able to project a lot of power. Almighty. Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 32, and I have to remind you, Jeremiah lived in a time that was tough. Everything was falling apart for the people of God. And here's what Jeremiah says. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God is omnipotent. Notice, and and I've referenced this before, but one of the, the earliest creeds that Christians have that we sometimes read together and we have a lot of songs that are based off of it is the Apostles' Creed. And how does it begin? I believe in God the Father Almighty. It's foundational. It's right up front to who we believe. God is Almighty. And once again, God's power is different than yours and mine. Okay, as I'm getting older, I'm working out harder and harder and harder to decay slower and slower and slower. Okay, I can't even keep up with what I was before, and I got to work to get there. God doesn't do that. God's not getting weaker. God never had to grow to get stronger. He inherently and immediately is not just powerful or able to exert power, all power is his there is not one ounce of power anywhere in the entire universe that is not borrowed power from god anywhere even his enemies that are attempting to exert power are attempting to exert borrowed power okay that's that's power That is almighty. Now, once again, if you consider what I'm saying, your head should start wobbling a little bit. This is not the way you and I are. God's not a little bigger version of us. He's holy, 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 distinct, separate. When you see this, you start saying, 
I get why they're all worshiping all the time. He's different than we are. Now, secondly, God is not only infinite, God is eternal. In a sense, this is his infinity given towards time and space. God is eternal with no beginning or end. Notice in Revelation 4, 8 to 10. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In verse 9, they reference him as being who lives forever and ever. And in verse 10, they reference him again as who lives forever and ever. Their phrase, twice he lives forever and ever. They're saying God is eternal. Uh, The old Hebrew and Greek, they oftentimes say it's into the ages of the ages. Whatever ages you can think of, whenever you get there, God's already there. God exists in that way. And then notice this phrase, and we sang it in holy, holy, holy this morning, you know, who wert and art and evermore shall be. Here uh, in Revelation, it's who was and is and is to come. Now that's a way of just saying he's past, he's present, and he's future, but it means even more than that. This phrase is coming out of Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. In Exodus 3, as God is about to bear his arm and deliver his people from bondage and slavery, as the gospel is coming to deliver Israel, Moses says, who do I tell him is sending me? Who is it that's coming to bring judgment on these gods? And in Exodus 3, 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. You are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now this phrase, it sounds strange, it's the Hebrew word. When you read it in, in Hebrew, um, the, the word is simply the word for I am. Just like we have our I am, you are, he, she, it is, uh, is they have yik, yes, he is. That's their, their uh, form of it. And in fact, the word Yahweh, in the next phrase where it says, say to the Israelites, the Lord, that, that word Lord there, uh, which is capitalized, that's the word Yahweh, or Jehovah, some people pronounce it as. That's derived out of I am. It's just another, they're taking the, the phrase out of I am and doing it. And so God is saying, this is my name. If you want to know about me, my name is I am. I am the existent one. When they translated this into Greek, they actually used the phrase, they, they didn't know exactly how to do it, so they did this, this Greek phrase, ego e mi ha on. The, the ego e mi is I am. You remember we look at the, the I am sayings that Jesus does in John's Gospel seven times. I am. This is where the phrase comes from. But it is literally, I am the existent one. I am being. I eternally exist. Everything is present to me. So notice he references there that the Lord, the God of your fathers. When you go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am. To you who are sitting in Egypt, I am. When you go to your descendants far into the future, you can't think, I am. God is the eternal I am, transcending time itself. And the amazing thing is, God doesn't get old. See, where I tell my grandkids all the time when they climb up in my lap or they want me, a lot of Sundays, they didn't do it this morning, but a lot of Sundays, two of my granddaughters, or sometimes three of them, are fighting and saying, Papa, hold me. And after a little while, Papa's like, Papa's getting old. <laughs> I don't know. Papa loves holding y'all, but this gets tired. See, God's not getting old. Amen. He's not getting tired because God doesn't even exist the way you and I do. We live in the space-time continuum. Time exists because space exists. Before there was space, before there was time, there is God. God is I am. A thousand years ago, science sometimes say that the universe is 14.7 billion years old. Well, guess what? If it is 14.7 billion years ago, and there is now, and if you go 15 billion years in the future, none of them are any more distant from God. He envelops all of it. Every moment is present to him. He is eternal. And if you think you can wrap your mind around that, I was really bright thinking a 4.0 was within my grasp. You can't. You can't. This is beyond us. But it is who God is. 
And the only response is the knees need to start buckling. It's the only reasonable response to who this God is. And not only is God eternal, we need to understand when when God says, I am the I am, he necessarily exists. Here's a secret for you. You could not exist and the universe will be fine. I could not exist. It'll probably be a better place. Okay? God can't not exist. He essentially, necessarily exists. So notice in Revelation 4.11, at the end of their song, they say this, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. God is different than creation. Creation exists and is sustained by God's will, but God automatically, inherently, necessarily exists. And nothing else does. There was a time when we were not. There was a time when the universe was not. There was never a time when Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not. They always were and are and evermore shall be. Your life and mine, I am sucking air right now because it's God's pleasure to allow me to suck air and for no other reason. And if he didn't will it this moment, it would all be gone. Once again, That is beyond your comprehension and mine. And the only response is worship. Not only is God infinite and eternal, God is sovereign. He rules over all things. Now this is related to him being omnipotent in power, but this is stating that God is actually exercising that power. Again, notice in verse uh, 8, Revelation 4, 8, they refer to the Lord God Almighty. In 1 Timothy 1.17, a a phrase we sometimes use for for one of our benedictions, now to the king, eternal, immortal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Notice, he is the king. God is the king from all of eternity. He has all power, and he is right now exercising his will to bring glory to himself in his own time and way. Remember, we, why are we here? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And God, the central message of the Bible is God is bringing glory to himself through the person and work of Jesus Christ as he's creating and redeeming a people in whom he lives by his spirit so that they will glorify and enjoy him forever. It is about God and he is accomplishing that. God will accomplish all he desires in the end and nothing and no one is going to stop that. Okay? I remember the night that I, I was proposing to Linda, I decided I was going to take her down by Triton Light at the Academy and look out at the bay, and it was going to be beautiful. But since I'm not omniscient, I didn't look into the future and realize it was going to be like 20 degrees and sleeting. But being a good Marine, I had a plan B. And plan B was Memorial Hall. We were going to go up and we were going to overlook the bay because Memorial Hall never had anybody in it except that night. And there were about 300 midshipmen up there. And I looked to her and I said, I don't have a plan C. (laughs) I didn't go that deep in my contingencies. Other things were messy. See, God never has to have plan B. He never has to have plan C. He knows all things and he is working all things. Now, This does not mean that everything is okay in this world. If you think everything is okay in this world, you are not paying attention. It's a mess out there. It is a mess out there. It is broken, and so God's sovereignty does not give you and I an excuse for our own sin or a reason to not be engaged in the fight against evil. Okay, let me be very, very clear. The fruit of evil is seen the world over right now. It is seen in poverty. It is seen in racism. It is seen in hate-filled rhetoric. 
it's seen in El Paso and Dayton. Okay, And one of the reasons that these things happen is because we don't believe and understand who this God is. And so I look at people who are different than me and think I'm somehow better than them. When the reality is God is the one who is great and we are all in need of mercy. We are all in need of grace. And so when we hear the sovereignty of God, that is never an excuse for a Christian to not engage in the fight against evil. Part of how God is exercising his sovereignty, part of the mystery of it all, is he is calling the church to be engaged and to speak hope in a broken world, to work against these things that are so evil and so broken and so trust in sovereignty of god if anybody ever tells me god is sovereign and therefore i am inactive you do not understand the sovereignty of god god is so sovereign he's actually working through us that is what he is working to do it should propel us into the fight against evil you are blessed to be a blessing we are called to engage the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And friends, it is broken. And read the book of Revelation. I hate to give you the bad news. It stays broken right until Jesus comes back. But I want to remind you the reason this doctrine is there. The sovereignty of God is not a nice philosophical point that we can all debate over. Revelation is written to a suffering church. Because when you wake up and you look and you see what happened in El Paso and you see what happened in Dayton, you can sit there and say, is God really sovereign? Is he really at work right now? And Revelation is written to assure us, yes, he is. He is working. He is accomplishing his will. Do not lose hope. That is the message in Revelation over and over again. And it is a reason why the suffering church spends way more time in Revelation than we do. And they don't get out of it the goofy things we tend to get out of it. They get out of it hope. God is sovereign. God is still working this out. I can hang on. And for us as the people of God, it lets us know not only, here's the good news in Scripture, if you are Joseph and you've been sold into slavery, betrayed by your brothers, when you try to stand up for holiness and do what God calls you to do, you're betrayed by your master's wife and sent into a dungeon and everybody forgets you. What Joseph comes to the end and realizes is, in all of that, God was working for my good. And he will turn every last bit of it to my good and through me to the good of others. That's the message of Revelation, friends. If you are the people of God, whatever you face, God will work to your good. Not always easy to see. I'm not infinite in knowledge. Sometimes I don't get it. But what I do know is on the final day, I will look back and say, oh, I see. I was blind, but now I see. Now, last thing, and then we'll turn to applying the word, is God in creation. Because God in himself is infinite, eternal, and sovereign. And then out of that, God has created. So notice Revelation 4.11 in our text. You're worthy. You, this infinite, eternal, sovereign being, are worthy. And then he goes on and says, For you created all things. God is the creator of everything that exists. And when we did question one in the catechism, I remind you this. Consider how foundational the doctrine of God being the creator is. Genesis 1.1. What's the first thing we hear about God in the Bible? In the beginning, God created. We go to the uh, creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Our first question in the catechism, why did God create humans? Creation is not an esoteric doctrine. Creation, hear me clearly, creation did not simply arise by random chance. And if it did, eat, drink, and, uh, and be merry because tomorrow you're going to die and rot. This is a purposeless, meaningless universe if this all just randomly sprang into existence. But if it was created by a personal, sovereign God, there is reason to have hope. 
We are, we are in a universe. It is literally, we are in a universe with no meaning, or we in a, are in a universe that is bristling and filled with meaning. God is the creator. And not only that, he is the sustainer. Notice again that last phrase, you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. He not only created it all, he holds it together moment by moment. This world will, and universe will run its course until God's will determines Jesus is coming back and it is all over. He is sustaining it. They are having their being. It is back to that, that word for I am. Literally, they are existing. You and I exist moment by moment by the pleasure of God. All creation sprung into existence from the will and pleasure of God, and it only continues to exist moment by moment because of his will and pleasure. What that means, once again, is if you understand this, God, there's only one response. It's worship. There is no other rational response. Now, how do we apply this? We're going to worship in just a minute. But before we do, I want to ask a question of us. Do I see the importance of accurately knowing who God is? Again, if you go off and you go to a job, or you're like me and you go to the academy, and, and you misestimate your capabilities and everything, usually no harm, no foul. You'll, you'll, you'll come back around. But this is one, it's not that way. This is the beginning of everything. A.W. Tozer's question, show me what we think about God, it, everything else is going to flow from that. It'll tell you who we are as a people. If we don't start with this, but rather with humans, we're going to run off into the ditch quickly. And much of theology and much of even the worship of the church today starts from below. Much of it looks and says, well, let's make man the center of everything. Everything is about us. Friends, it's not. And if you understand this infinite, eternal, sovereign creator and sustainer of everything, there's, not, there's no way I'd say, but I still think I ought to be the center of it all. It doesn't make any sense. But that's precisely what we have been embarked on a journey to try and do. And so if we answer this question wrong, everything else is wrong. All the biblical doctrines of humanity, sin and the fall, the law of God, the gospel, salvation, eternity, they only make sense if God is the infinite, eternal, sovereign creator of everything. If it's a different God, all those other doctrines make no sense. They all flow from him. One of the problems in our culture today, we're even trying to define morality apart from the character and person of God. You can't do that. There's no basis for it otherwise. So it all has to go back to God. And if we reduce God from this awesome description, what ends up happening is we become the master, he becomes the servant, we become the judge and jury, and he's the accused. Have you ever heard people say, well, I tell you what, on judgment day, God's got some questions to answer. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I got news for you. When you see him, there's not going to be questions. There's going to be hugging the ground. And if you're a believer, of course, there's going to be gratitude for Jesus Christ. The arrogance we have to think that we could question God. But friends, we do. That's what we do. But it's because we've reduced God down. And if we reduce him from this awesome description, rather than God being the center of the story, I become the center of the story. Rather than worship being about what is pleasing and glorifying to God, it's what I like. Did I get something out of that? What was in it for me? Everything. That, that, that's the battle that goes on here, and it's the battle that's been going on from the garden. Okay, remember, we're the image of God, second in all of creation, and somehow that wasn't good enough. And we've been fighting that fight and struggle ever since. And if 
we reduce God from this awesome description, the other final thing is, it becomes fertile breeding ground for every sort of mistreatment of our fellow humans. Because if we become the measure, if we become the standard, anything is possible. Because then I start gauging whether I'm better than you and what needs to happen. That it is breeding ground for disaster. And even an atheist like Nietzsche saw that, warned us of that, and it's still what we embrace. So what do I think about God? Do I understand this awesome description? Now what we're going to do today, we're going to respond to this call to worship of God in the gospel. I've done my best to present to you the infinite, eternal, sovereign creator. If you see that, there's only one response. Right now you should be wanting to say, I want to join in with the beast. I want, I want to holler, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It's what everyone in the text does. Look at pictures. When you get glimpses in heaven, almost every time in the book of Revelation, what's going on? They're, they're worshiping. That's what they're doing constantly, nonstop. Because when you see God as he is, every fiber in your being says, I want to worship him, or I want to get away from him. There are pictures where the evil are fleeing, all of creation's rolling up and trying to get away. It's one, we either are running to him to fall down before him or trying to hide, which is foolish since there's nowhere to hide. So I want to encourage us. And as a believer, you have a double reason because the amazing thing is this infinite God I've been talking about loves you. By my sin, I have rebelled. I have committed cosmic treason. I have spit in his face. And I have done it over and over and over again. And his response to me in the gospel is grace. Amen. If if. His greatness and His grace don't make you want to worship. I got nothing for you. Please see me afterwards. <laughs> we need to talk. Because it's got to draw us out of us. This infinite God knows you by name. We get to continue in Psalm 139. Before you were created, when you were in your mother's womb, he knew you. He was knitting you together. He called you before there was space and time. He had set his affection on you in Christ and called you when you were dead in trespasses and sins. He raised you up. He made you an inheritor of all that he has, and he will keep and he will sustain you until the final day you're before him. The infinite God does that for insignificant people like you and me. That is a call to worship. So what we're going to do, we're going to stand together, and the worship team is going to lead us in the song, God is Great. And we're going to sing his praise, and then I will come up and we will conclude with a word of benediction. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we do give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. Father, you are holy, holy, holy. You are the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. Amen. Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for Amen. you have created all things. You have made us, yes, and we exist by your will and for your pleasure. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we pray this week you would empower us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we live quorum Deo, right before the face of God. And Lord, as we live, may our every thought, our every word, our every act and deed be pleasing in your sight. Yes, our rock, our creator, you, our redeemer. In Jesus' name, you, amen. amen. amen.
Now may the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, to whom is honor for glory forever and ever, may He reveal Himself to you this week and bless you abundantly. Go forth blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.